captions transcript safe. This is the Neobooks call for Monday, January 15th, 2024. Um, and yeah, we were just talking about uh, how real the unreal stuff is and how increasingly real it's going to appear, how much it's going to invade our lives. I'm just sending a note to Jesse um, because I think she wanted to join, but she may not have the right link. Good. She probably does because I just realized that my new new link that works is the same link as the old link, and I don't really understand what Zoom is doing. And Pete, I, I have not created separate Zoom links for each of the meetings yet, uh, but I got sort of halfway because now I don't have to go in and change settings every time I open a Zoom. There you go. So I like I like that, and I turned off the continuous chat. I think that's probably best for now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Stuart. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hi, Rick. Excellent. Uh, any updates, uh, thoughts? Uh, we sort of come back into our pace here a little bit, hopefully. And uh, where are y'all? There's Jesse. Um, I'm working with a team of folks writing a uh, one uh, one chapter per person. Uh, we're writing a, a little anthology about AI stuff, AI and creativity, more or less. Um, so, uh, in in a different life or something that might it might actually be called a new book, but the the first publication is going to be a Kindle KDP, um, and then after that, the the next. Uh, the next notional milestone is making a video of your um, of your chapter, and some of the at least one or two of the people I think will be pretty good at making um, making a video AI ish video. So um, none of that is NeoBook incompatible. Um, what are you thinking? I, you know, in in a way, it's it's kind of a NeoBook uh, because the idea after that is to keep you know making different different uh, assets out of each chapter. Um, the, the, some of the, some of the direct kind of relationships are, um, uh, this is an effort led by Cindy Kuhn, uh, and she's done a lot of KDP, uh, and she has a designer who helps her with the KDP P stuff. So, um, we are, most of us, I think, are writing Google Docs, um, but I'm pretty sure it's going to get saved to Word, and then the Word is going to go to, through KDP stuff, um, and then I don't know exactly where some other format will pop out. But um, so I, you know, like it's in the mix that that I'm going to have at least a a um, side a passenger view of KDP. Um, I've done KDP stuff myself uh, a long, long time ago, like 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so it's not like a, it's totally new to me, but um, I, I, I am here for about 30 minutes too. F F I. Thanks, Rick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the other news I have real quick is um, uh, one of the things that Google Docs has always bedeviled me with is um, if you have links in a Google Doc, um, it wraps every link in a Google search. Um, so when you export it to HTML or something, like if you're moving it towards KDP um, or, you know, a more massive wiki or whatever, um, you get these weird Google search links. Um, so I've got code now that strips that back to um, reasonable, hmm. reasonable links. <laughs> Sorry to be all techie, but... Um, no, that's right. That's this, good. The, the techie stuff, it, you know, aside from that, there's another another interest I've got, which is collaboration. I could tell a bunch of stories about uh, the Cindy Kuhn AI project and the way that we're collaborating and, and the terror that we've had from deadlines and stuff like that. So but another time. Um, and I was in the, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask Pete, is it a good story or a bad story? It's it's a human story. Um, I, the, one of the one of the big lessons of the whole thing is uh, since it's a book about AI and AI stuff, right? Image generation and uh, text. Um, everybody is like all in on using ChatGPT to help you write. 
um, uh, without, you know, without being ashamed about or weird about or anything because they're <coughs> like really uh, conversant in it. Um, so uh, a lot of the reactions have come back and it's like, okay, well, I used the bot <laughs> and then I had to tear all that apart and write it myself anyway, you know, stuff like that. The, the other thing is uh, we're trying to go pretty fast and write individually, but um, it's turned out that um, even leakage wise, it's been really important for us to stay together as a team. The, the idea that Cindy had is, hey, everybody just have fun and do a thing, do, you know, dash off a quick 5,000 words, which wasn't quick for me. Um, dash off a quick 5,000 words and we'll stick it all together, call it anthology, push it out, right? It doesn't have a, an overall narrative arc or didn't, didn't intend to. Um, but as everybody writes, we've been having weekly meetings and everybody kind of looks across the desk, my thing isn't working out, or, you know, when I went through your stuff, thanks so much for the, you know, the comments you made on for me. Um, for me personally, I actually um, sent Cindy an email last mid last week, uh, this, this previous week was kind of our, you know, getting close to final deadline. I'm like, I, I'm two days away from the deadline, I don't see the, you know, I've got this vision and it's not gelling on the page and I'm going to have to bow and I'm sorry. So that was enough to cause a, a, a couple people to like, you know, get in and, and, and on the, the group call, you know, Hey Pete, we support you, you know, do it this way, do it that way, you know, blow up the, blow up the target and just turn in uh, Wendy, Wendy Alfred's idea was just turn in a picture screenshot of the, the small piece that you wrote, the 1500 word piece, you know, X'd out, just turn that in and say, this is the process, you know, things get weird and stuff happens. The, so anyway, the, the big story is that working with people, even when you've got a lot of AI assistance, working with people is the magic sauce. So that's like the overall story. Yeah, you remind me by, by sharing that story. You know, one of, my, one of the elements of my agreement model is renegotiation. Uh, you know what you know when you begin. You don't know what you don't know. And as you go down, the path, <laughs> as you go down the path, shit gets revealed, and and you've got to deal with it effectively. So, yeah, and, and it's easiest to do that um, with other people's emotional support and in negotiation with other people. As it as <laughs> is the lesson for me. That that is a foundational piece along with trust. Without that, you're you're not going anyplace. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Pete. You know, I, have, um, I'm back here in in uh, Southern California, where we used to live for you know, quite a few years, and so I'm meeting my church friends, and got into a discussion on biblical meaning and and context, <clears throat> and it just inspired me to have a conversation with the AI on mm -hmm. uh on um pattern recognition which because i believe that the, the scriptures uh to a large degree define patterns uh in human behavior and in in group, mm, in group behavior and so i i just went through um an exercise there and, and i thought it was it came out pretty interesting in fact i would I would love to pursue that further and see if anybody is interested in uh, uh, in engaging uh, in a uh, discussion like this because, I mean, clearly the uh, uh, spiral dynamic spectrum blue is dominating the discussions out there. Yeah, I mean, you look at the uh, conservative Christian movement and uh, their beliefs and and what they are embracing, there's there is a lot of confusion into what it means, and then of mm. course, uh, what happened since I since I wrote this, all of a sudden my YouTube channel is sending me all these uh, these uh, conversations, <laughs> whichever way that happens, um, where you had some if some some fascinating scholars you know, deploy, explain in biblical uh, history um, and the research related around it and uh, how how uh, messed up it really is. So anyway, I just uh, I send it over to Pete. Maybe someone is interested to um, to pursue that conversation because I think it's absolutely fascinating and. 
the depth with which the AI engages here is just mm -hmm. really incredible. <clears throat> you know, because you get uh, such a broad uh, feedback on state of the art thinking uh, about mm. uh, you no know, very specific uh, subtopics. So anyway, but um, since a couple are leaving uh, early, I wanted to see if Jesse uh, could give an update on where she's going with her project. You know, also with David here, that's a good uh, opportunity, Jesse. Do you want to uh, grab it and and share? Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Um, I'm I just this is the the time where I just come out of a, a workout and I'm sweaty and just you know I'm just not <laughs> wanting to get on a call. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when you were talking about spiral dynamics, I definitely want to get deeper in that. And I was trying to I actually planted a question to you in the community <laughs> that I invited you to, Klaus. Um, and I don't, you didn't bite, but, um, no one else bit either. So I'm just interested in, um, use and, and, uh, applying that to the food, uh, the industry of food. So whatever that looks like, if you want to invite us to a call, I'm there, or maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow when we talk. My update, I really don't know exactly what the, the purpose of this meeting is. I haven't really been paying attention too much in terms of it's it's about writing and neo books and uh, it could be anything around AI I'm thinking but I'm I'm still trying to figure that out I'm just putting that out there um, being transparent that I'm a little ignorant right now of what I'm into um, but I I do love the idea of integrating spiral dynamics in that that red to green kind of leveling up of eating from the sad diet this the standard American diet all the way to the Glad is what I, I call it, <laughs> the good lifestyle and diet, um, and trying to use AI to help support people to to transition over time, and some gamification maybe. Uh, so that's that's really, and integrating that into the app and the community itself through Slack. So that's where I'm at. I would love help with technology. I'm also very much into um, figuring out how to visualize the data that I have for, in Kumu um, when it comes to. Um, my hometown and what food is like in just a micro uh, level, uh, just trying to visualize how people, how connections are being made from the, the grocery store to the, the, the food co-op, to the um, farmers, to the, to the consumers. It's just, it's fascinating. And, and I did start out last year in the, with the SDGs and called good strings and tried to visualize that on a small level to be able to, um, <clears throat> to support the SDGs on a, on a small level. But the, the reason why I'm here today is because I've chosen food as a way to impact SDGs from one angle, one topic, and just really stay very focused because I've been very divergent all my life and I want to stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. Um, have you gotten con real conversant in Kumu or how are you, how, how, what is, how's your relationship with Kumu these days? Oh, well, I did an entire database last year, and then I came back to it this year, and I'm like, what? What? How did I do that? It's just like someone else did it for me. It was weird. Um, I've been talking with uh, Wendy's right-hand person. What's his name? Um, Is it Gene, Gene uh, Bellinger? No. Someone else? Uh, no. Vincent? Vincent, okay. thank Wendy. you. Oh, yeah. Okay, Wendy McLean. Yeah. Cool. Um, so... Maybe get a little bit deeper into it, uh, Jesse. So Jesse is developing an app uh, that can run on uh, on on your phone, and it can help you to um, to uh, structure your your meal plan uh, and also your shopping list in ways that supports uh, your personal health, but also has an environmental consciousness. So, so it means that um, you will see the environmental impact of your decisions you know, in real time. Um, and, and so that, so how, how to frame that up? I mean, Jesse, feel free to grab the screen and show um, and show the uh, uh, what the app looks like. Uh, but that's sort of in a nutshell. Um, and of course, we would like to get the attention of... Um, of students primarily here you know there is a lot of uh 
uh, I'm connected with uh, uh, the Sophie Egan, who is the founder of the uh, Menus of Change initiative at Harvard and Stanford. Uh, and they are also working, you know, on on getting students to understand uh, the impact of food uh, on health and agriculture. So it's it's I that it. Devin. So it's it's I, it's. Go ahead, Chesie. I'd be happy to share um, the the experience. Um, I think what I'm finding is that community is where really the experience is at. People want to. <laughs> um be not do this alone there's a lot of uh opinions when you're saying i'd like to go healthier like even let's just say vegan i'm not i don't say i i want to help people go vegan because there's a lot of unhealthy vegans out there but um when, when someone says in a family structure i'd like to change my diet there's a lot of pushback and it's really uh it's if you have the discipline to be able to stick with it despite your peers or your family not doing it, that seems to be the most, the, the biggest indicator if you're going to change your diet. And not the app, but community that you know that other people are going to support you through the process. So I'm really trying to um, build this community up so that it helps people know that they belong. And so I could share my screen really quick to show you both if you want, just maybe take three minutes. That'd be great. Who, yeah, okay. Um, I'm on my phone, so this will be interesting. I've never done yep. it on my phone. Okay, so Plant Powered is, it's it's a, a web app, but it's on, you can put it as a, as a app on your phone. So that's what you're getting is you can have both different experiences. Um, so you start your day and, um, and then if you, it's really an educational app. So yes, it's not about tracking calories or nutrition, um, although you are going to um, meet your nutritional goals if you actually follow this list. So you don't, if there's a redu reduction of the food anxiety every single day trying to figure out what should I eat, what should I eat, where the anxiety shows up is how do I make it? There's a lot of people who just don't have time <laughs> and will just ask for something to be delivered. So. Um, working with partners to figure that out, um, how to do this, but to log it as if you buy something and you can log it here. So let's say that you ate some blueberries. You can log it. And I had a half a cup. And then you meet your, your you could see under the blueberry, the berries section, you met it. And it's very much like Dr. Greger's kind of um, 12, if, you, if you've known about that. But it, it helps you actually learn about the foods a little bit more uh, and then you can see as you go farther up the level goes up from level one sad diet all the way to green uh, plant powered so you can look at today's log and see where you're at um, <clears throat> but then if you go on to foods you can look up hibiscus tea or farro and um, let's just say um, you were interested in chickpeas and you understand what the nutrients are and high and you can look into the video of dr gregor i pull that in here and, and then somehow we're going to integrate like you know meals somehow but there's recipes here and you know, how to make hummus and if you could log the recipe you can how much macronutrients if you're very into that and then um, if you are wanting some guidance you can put in your birthday your gender how how much you weigh and how much you want to be and how active, active you are. And it shows you how much you should be eating for calories and protein and so forth. Um, only for those who really are saying, hey, how much protein should I be eating? And it, and it does back it up through <clears throat> USDA, um, although not everyone believes the USDA is the accurate um, source, but I understand that. But yeah, there's a lot of different, um, it's a beautiful app that's educational is set up as an educational app so that you can learn. I have, I have a few users who went from flexitarian all the way to 70% plant forward diets, and they feel so much better that, about the foods they're eating because they've been learning about each food and what the impact is on the, on the environment. Um, there's also even a, a food is medicine um, section that I'm trying to build into the community 
and have conversations around. So if I look up the Slack channel and food as medicine, um, we are discussing what that looks like here. And I like to invite people that are doctors in the food as medicine and health practitioners to represent. And then when you see the kitchen, I like to invite chefs that are plant forward, um, like Chef Brandon Rouge is a plant forward vegan, uh, vegan uh, sushi chef. <laughs> so have people, you know, be represented and use this as a platform to educate and increase awareness and then actually lock arms to uh, work on initiatives together. That's that. That's awesome. I'm so glad that demo worked so well. That was a hey, good debut. Good debut. Thanks, Jesse. Um, I'm one of the things that I'm that interests me a lot in vegetarian vegan cooking is just like uh, sort of in the recipe section. But a lot a lot of us lack imagination on what to do with veggies, <laughs> and there's a bunch of interesting ways to sort of solve that that uh, I'm interested in. But uh, Pete's got his hand up. Um, thanks, Jay. Uh, thanks, Jesse. It looks awesome. Uh, like totally, totally awesome. Um, uh, I I wanted to I wanted to butt in with an AI thing. Um, uh, you might have heard about OpenAI's uh, GPT store. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time yet uh, because you still have to be a Chat GPT Plus subscriber to use any of them, which I think is a crazy thing. But I think they're going to fix that in in a matter of months. Um, so the hotness right now is to have a GPT. So I think it's really obvious in 2024, if you have an information app like that, or a website or a book, you also want a GPT. You're going to be distributing the same information as a, a chatbot called a GPT through OpenAI store, maybe other, other stores. So that's something to kind of keep on the radar and, and to think about. Um, uh, they're not hard to develop, um, but there are some kind of gotchas and the other... The other weird thing is going to be figuring out how to get through the cut through the noise of millions of other GPTs clamoring for your attention. But I'm really convinced that it's going to be, you know, uh, at the end of 2024, you know, it, it, it will be like insanely obvious that you have a GPT more than you have a book or a website or, or an app or something like that. Um, the other thing real quick, uh, Jesse mentioned uh, community. I wanted to kind of validate that. I had a great experience uh, with a co-founder um, who was the idea person. Uh, I was the CTO. Uh, we built an app and this was like 10 years ago. So it was right when apps were first, I think 10 or 15 years ago. Um, Zach Lynch and I had a company uh, uh, for a while called Cash Coach and we had some other names, but the idea was uh, you to, if you wanted to change, make a big life change, like lose weight or quit smoking or something like that. Um, we figured out how to, um, recruit a, a team of your friends and family around you, uh, to help you meet that goal. And in the testing of that app, um, it was just like insane off the charts. It was super successful. Um, and we kind of fell down, um, based on, um, um, you know, marketing and stuff like that and stuff that wasn't part of the, the way the app worked. Um, the, the good slash bad news was the way that we got that, recruited that team around you um, was that people would pledge, um, you know, $5, $10, $50 towards a goal of yours. You know, I want to, I want to go on a special vacation or I want to buy a laptop or these, there's these awesome shoes. If I lose weight, I'm going to buy these super cool shoes or whatever. And it's it it startled us how effective that was um, because it turned out that not only do people kind of like people in our, our culture you know for better or for worse are have to kind of be driven by money you make uh, financially d driven dis uh, choices but there was also like an insane amount of compliance when grandma puts in her you know hard won 25 bucks into your thing there's no way that you can disappoint grandma and give her back her 25 bucks, right? It's like, you don't do that. So uh, it, it was a way of kind of locking in um, engagement around a, 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 a tough goal. So, um, so it'll be really cool, Jesse, to see you start to have community stuff built into your app as well as, uh, as, well as you know, individual information-based stuff. The community stuff is, is super, super uh, important. Thank you, Pete. I took a lot of notes down and was inspired by your idea of 
um, supporting, getting it supported by a group. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you both. Um, Pete, do you want to riff for a moment about the possibilities of AGPT for Jesse's app? Because part of what you said was, I think we're moving into a world where we'll probably be talking GPTs, not so much apps, and it seems like there's a natural fit there, but you're deeper into it. You're both deeper into it than I. Um, in, in lieu of doing that, um, uh, Jesse, if you'd be interested, I'd love to show you how GPTs work and, and, um, and things like that. And then maybe yeah, we can um, report out. I'm meeting with later. Klaus tomorrow. He was so kind to meet last week for um, showing that what the 4.0 experience is versus 3.5. It's smarter for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but how to integrate it into the app. It seems like I have to pay extra money to, and I'm just like, I have to first make a, um, um, this sustainable somehow as um making money for the app so it's paid for itself so I can put in chat GBT. I know that that's just going to level it up for sure. I, um, for, for instance, like you can choose all the, the ingredients you have and just say, hey, what make three meals out of this. And I just, I do that on my myself manually and I love it. Um, integrating chat GPT, GPT-4 into an app through the API calls is actually pretty cheap. Um, so, so it may be worth it, it may be worth kind of activating that uh, earlier than you think. It's it's pretty cheap. Um, it gets expensive at scale, of course, but you know by the time you have scale, um, it, that's a different problem. Um, if I may just be ran one test um, where Jesse uh, 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 gave an arbitrary list of ingredients in her refrigerator, and I ran it through the AI and says write a menu with this now yeah. for three days. And it's just, boom, instantly it converted the ingredients in the refrigerator into menus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you can also do things like snap a picture of your fridge and say, what can I make? Um, oh, my so gosh. I have to send this this thing where it's a um, WhatsApp chat GPT. All they did was they took a number in WhatsApp and you just text it called text Rex. Or did someone in this group tell me about this? I don't remember no? that. Okay. Um, it's called text rex look it up um try it out what what they do is they create an you can take a picture of your food and it will immediately take in in your text it will say this is three thirty percent protein and da, da, da. And, um if i can figure out how to do that with it's, this app it's not that this yeah, looks phenomenal um the, the ai you know stuff or sorry the api stuff for that is not not that hard so so then there are two different things one of them is integrating gpt4 so um or gpt4v the v stands for vision so that um people can you know use natural language um instead of instead of something else um separately from that there's a thing uh I got text uh, recommendations out of that, what, what Jesse said. Um, separately from integrating with GPT-4 is creating a GPT. Um, and they picked a generic name for marketing reasons or whatever. So it's confusing. But a GPT is a custom version of ChatGPT, which has extra information that you supply. Um, and then it's it generally stays within the domain space uh, that you've you've nominated for it. Um, so so um, in the domain of uh, you know personal nutrition and, and food and stuff like that, you can preload a bunch of information into its brain that's different than the general information that it could get off of a web search. And it will use, you can tell it to use mostly that. Um, and be a wizard for you know uh, interacting with people um, based on on that knowledge base. So that's called a GPT. And then the reason it matters at all is because uh, ChatGPT has has decided that the way to productize ChatGPT is not to have a general purpose bot that can do anything for everybody, uh, which is what we've got now, um, because most people don't know what to do with a, a bot that can do everything for everybody. So if you say, 
um, I have a GPT that will help you build a Formula One race car, or I have a GPT that will give you tips and tricks on learning how to do photography, or I have a GPT that knows all about uh, environmental concerns and soil health and, and uh, personal diet choices and things like that. So you, you say that I have a bot that does this and their, their marketing push and their hype push is all <laughs> around compartmentalizing ChatGPT into specific bots um, that that have a thing. So, so it's I, I don't know if this will work for people, but um, there was a time on Facebook when Facebook allowed people to start developing apps, and for like two or three years, if you were developing an app for Facebook, you were golden because uh, you know it it was this whole new way of interacting with um with information in the world and people and stuff like that so it's kind of the same thing um you get the the reason to do it is partly because it's practical and partly because if you're a teenager nowadays you're going to be talking to bots rather than any you know books mm. or people or anything like that it's just going to be the way that people do it in a you know six months a year um uh, and then the other reason to do it, like get on the bandwagon now and learn about it um, is because there's a, a big hype machine, you know, that's partly open AI and partly everybody thinking about chat GPT and open AI and AI in general, that's driving everybody to look at GPTs. So the right. flip side of it is there's literally millions already, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's a really practical thing. It's a really useful thing. It's more useful than a website or a book. Um, and then also right now, it's also the new hotness. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> if it's cheap enough, I'll, do I, do you mind if I reach out, if I have a question? Please, Please? do. Um, okay, I'd, I'd love to show you more. And... Right on. Thank you very much. And Rick, yeah, when I get definitely. Netflix, I'll be looking at that because I've heard about it over and over. About this. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. You're welcome, Jesse. Um, and I apologize all. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop off. Uh, have a good call. Um, Rick had to drop off as well. Thanks, Pete. See you around. Um, so I'll ahead, take, yeah, I'll take a minute to share. Um, so I've started to take my manuscript and share it um, in different places. Um, uh, and anything I do with it is, um, it's not mutually exclusive in terms of um, the Neo book context. But I shared it uh, last Friday um, in the Society um, 2045 slash radical um, call and had a lot of positive feedback about the overall gest gestalt of it. And um, and some specific recommendations and and things to do. Um, so I was pleased with that, and I will continue to do that. Um, also with some people that I know in in my network. Um, and so exactly where it will all go, I'm not sure, but I'm still excited about the prospect of um, uh, doing a neo book um, and seeing where that goes. That that being said, just listening to um, to Pete talk about GPT, um, I was I was kind of and the conversation with you, Jesse. I was kind of when I heard the notion of take a photo of your refrigerator and get recipes, you know, um, or menus, you know, spit back at you. That's one of the most fun things in the world for me um, on retreat about. It was about four years ago. I ended up cooking for 25 people um, and was confronted with just what you're talking about. And though it uh, involved a lot of mental capacity and creativity, it was so much fun um, to do. So I'm just kind of sitting with that. Um, that was kind of a little bit of a, a negative impulse. But on the positive side, I, I thought about... Um, the whole notion of feeding all of the knowledge that I have around conflict and collaboration into a, a GPT and, and creating, it's kind of like, it's something I never did. I always thought about doing an app um, 
but this seems like a, a next generation of what an app might do. So um, that's uh, that's about all I have to say right now. But an interesting possibility to open that up with neo books. I mean, and and Pete's statement of um, oh, you know, young young people won't be interacting. Um, or with books at all, they'll be interacting with um, with bots. I mean, it's a it's a world beyond my current understanding or thinking, though I have an inkling. That is a really interesting question. Uh, the idea of our, do these GPTs and things like them do chatbots basically make books obsolete because you can you can talk with the idea and the idea's creator in some magical interactive way. Yeah. Bots? Us, Dave, Jesse, mm -hmm. do you think that's going to be a thing? I think people are telling me it's going to be a thing. <laughs> I should get on board. <laughs> Klaus yeah. is definitely, I mean, he's kind of gave me an introduction to it and Pete was able to speak to it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested in learning more. I know how to make apps. I know how to make communities. I, If I could figure out how to integrate those two, I can maybe not have to go back to a corporate job, <laughs> help other people do it. There is, there is a huge gap you now with uh, uh, people who have just heard of AI and think uh, and heard so many negative things and all the evil it's going to do and so on. Um, and then some people who have tried working with it, but just really don't know how to go about it. And there is a skill set that you need to develop in order to query the AI. Uh, and uh, I mean, Pete has been uh, a terrific guide. Uh, and you know, when you followed the thread uh, on our uh, discussion thread, um, there were a lot of articles that came across where you know how do you uh, how do you train your AI? How do you talk? So, I mean, in this well, uh, paper about uh, the Revelations chapter two that I just wrote, clearly the AI didn't have a pre-formatted opinion on it. I had to guide it with my questions towards where I wanted to take it, meaning is there a pattern, is there a recognizable pattern, right, that is being expressed here that has that can be that can be seen across eras, and uh, so because it actually when I when I put out a, a hypothesis uh, using the church in Nazi Germany, it says yes those patterns apply to churches in Nazi Germany, but this is really conjecture. You know you can't really base a theory on that. So then I asked it. So are there other such? eras throughout the history of the Christian church that are similar in nature. And it instantly came back with, oh yeah, here there are like uh, five other examples. So there is a pattern, right? And then you can ask the question, well, the people who are you know, in this mindset, how do you, how do you penetrate? <clears throat> how do you communicate you know, with that? So you have to train the AI um, along the, the hypothesis that you have you know, and, and then you verify uh, whether the AI will support your hypothesis or shoot it down. You now, and and it it's very uh, uh, objective in that regard. I've had a lot of high of ideas that uh, were going nowhere because it just wouldn't support it. You now, and and conversely, uh, I had a like like in this case. It just boom puts a frame around it that's just incredible, and that would have taken me, you know, forever. I mean, would have, my God, but the research involved in 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 this would just be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you fact check the uh, responses to make sure that they all were actual eras or events that happened in history? I'm familiar with every single one of them. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, I can, yeah, I can kind of immediately see. Um, the notion of, of of starting to program and starting a movement, you know, who wants to be a peacemaker, <laughs> and not only not only you know content that I've developed, but just you know, um, including as you teach someone, 
uh, as you know, uh, uh, including the wisdom of the ages um, in that, and and creating a movement um, around that, moving people away from right, wrong, win, lose, fault, blame thinking into um, um, a new way of, of, of interacting with the world in situations where there is conflict. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, multiply, you know, using technology to multiply um, the efforts of those of us trying to um, uh, uh, create a little, create a different world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stuart. And it seems like we're hitting those kinds of questions all over the place these days. Yeah. It would be useful to have better tools for that, better, yep. better means. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dave, Ray, any thoughts on the, are we going to stop reading books and start talking to books and authors thing? Yeah, I don't, <laughs> you know, I assume, I assume we uh, all old technologies survive in some form, right? But um, uh, but I haven't. I mean, I guess the way I've been framing a similar question is is kind of around. I mean, so I've been talking about this: how do we build a, a, a stack for regenerative landscapes, right? And and it's like, what's the stack? Well, it's a it's a it's knowledge organized, right? So I think what you're saying is, are we going to come up with different ways of interacting with knowledge in some sense? I mean, I'm assuming I'm not going to read my fiction by talking with a bat. Uh, a bot. I'm still going to read fiction the way I probably already set up, right? But what I'm trying to do is like when I'm trying to accomplish something, will I do it in a different format? And, you know, if you, so I was thinking that, well, my stack is kind of like a library, right? Because I'm just trying to organize. It's a Dewey Decimal System for how do I do something? And I've got all this information out there and I'm trying to organize in a way that people can, can find it. Except I'm, I'm trying to do, you know, I really want the stack to to achieve a particular purpose. I want it to get better and I want it to get larger. So there's a dynamism that's built into it, uh, which I suppose is also kind of the way we think of platforms, right? So, so the, you know, the I don't know how to tear this all apart, but there's something about the staticness of the book. If the book is static, then you don't get the, that dynamic component. Um yeah. And, you know, that's why you like the first, I don't know, I'm, I'm even slowly learning that the first place you go to, to try to figure out how to do something is YouTube, right? So, you know, go watch the videos so that I can repair my toilet. Um, but, um, but yeah, anyway, so I, and so Jesse, yeah. I kind of, I don't know if we've actually met, but uh, nice to meet you. And I, I, really interesting stuff. And I, I was kind of, as you were talking, I was thinking about like, how do you have different lenses on this stuff? You know, because I know I've, I've played with the, like the Atkins diet. So like, oh, well, if the app gave me carb readouts and helped me with the diet, you know, could you could do other things with it kind of, and I don't know if that takes you to a good path or a bad path when you do things like that. But the other, the other one I was thinking about, I don't know if you met Bobby Fishkin. No, I haven't. Bobby's been doing a bunch of work over the last number of years on medicinal plants. And he's got this really kind of rich database of uh, what what maladies different plants can create. And he's done a ton oh, of background. Oh, my goodness. I would love to have that connection because I was thinking how this, you know, it's only whole food plant-based. So the, the idea of more plants on plates could actually be um, reaching out to what you're just saying right now. So I would love to connect with that. Yeah, happy to happy to connect here. I'll stick... Uh, uh, I just I just put his LinkedIn in the chat. Great. Right um, and yeah. Dave, and, Dave and I are both longtime friends of Bobby. So. Oh. He's and a I know he's been trying to build a in the Bay app around that around that thing, but uh, I don't know I don't know the current status of it really, but. Um, but yeah, just kind of the, the you know like I think the issue for me has been how do we. Well, you know, one question is, we, we said, how do we not be reductionist, right? What's it look like to be regenerative and not reductionist? And so how do we, which I think kind of one of the questions is, how do you solve more than one problem at a time? Which then it just gets complicated. It's hard to do products and stuff. So maybe it's a silly question. But, you know, one of the perspectives to me is this lens notion. It's like, well, okay, if I can look at diet, you know, from so many different perspectives, you know, um, you know, how do I, how do I build something that, you know, can grow and improve that it supports all these different lenses. And but then I think you just, I don't I, I confuse myself because I end up boiling the ocean a little bit. But. 
Yeah, I, well, I'd love to speak to that really briefly, just so that um, I meet people where they're at. So whatever their 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 belief system is, or whatever their culture of food is, wherever they what their goals are from one place to another, I just I just want to help them close that gap. And then educate them along the line that more plants are better. <laughs> and if you can get more plants on your plate, um, throughout, if you're like at a level, like when you sign up, you say if you're allowed a level one, two, three, four, or five, if you can get to a six, great. Uh, you don't want to go from a two to an eight. Um, or maybe someone would like I did. And there are people like that. But just meet people where they're at, help them close the gaps and help them understand the foods that they eat um, so that are closer to nature are better. What I've been coming at the food, you know, quote industry from this regenerative economy perspective, where what I care about is soil health or, you know, like yes. you know, class, classes language or uh, biodiversity or, um, you know, there's all these dimensions that you're, you know, like you kind of want to reinforce, but you want to beat people over the head with. So, uh. really interesting because um, if you take things like legumes, um, legumes in the body play really interesting sort of biochemical roles and complete proteins and all that kind of thing. Legumes in the soil play a different set of really interesting roles in the soil and soil health, right? As nitrogen fixers and whatever else, like you'll plant legumes in a field after growing a regular crop in order to sort of restore the soil, even in traditional architecture, uh, uh, agriculture, <laughs> that's funny. Um, and it would be fun to be able to access these things in some sippable way that still had, to still retain the insights and the connections. I'm really interested in the connections between these things. I love. I like the, the pattern that legumes are magic, are different magic in different realms, but that they contain a lot of magic, magic that they're kind of um, unassuming little little sort of round and oddly shaped things uh, that perform miracles. I, we just made some kit, kitchri. We just learned how to make kitchri recently, which is mung beans and rice and a bunch of spices and some other stuff. And it's delicious. Uh, Stuart, you're muted. Thank you. I spent a year on a raw food diet um, many years ago, and the fermented um, sauces um, that were part of a community that I was part of for uh, was were just amazing. I mean, I would literally come out of a, a communal meal saying to myself, I don't know what kind of drugs <laughs> they're serving in these sauces, but this stuff sure is good. And it sure makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, um, and, yeah. yeah, and I always think about the um, um, the NFL team. I can't remember which one it was. One of the players was on a vegan diet and had more and more players on the team joining the idea that we don't need proteins um, to have strength. Mm -hmm. There was an article recently about vegetarian athletes, which I will find <clears throat> in the Times, I think. Uh, yeah, The Game Changer. Actually, there's a documentary out called The Game Changers that just, uh, 2018, I'll put a link in the chat. Yeah, we just would... talked. We just talked about it last week. That's right. Yeah, we just talked about it last week. And um, yeah. the lot of, a lot of people who are athletes or yeah, you're you're speaking to well. Am I going to get enough nutrition to certain for certain subset of people? And then there's another subset of people. Or am I going to get shamed? So it's like there's these. As long as we can go deeper into what's going to stop them and hold them back from going forward, that's kind of the con conversation I would like to have with people. How to do that? I'm sure there's a chat GPT to help me do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, Jesse, because you're you're bringing up, am I going to get shamed is one of the questions. Am I going to get bored is another one of the questions. Yeah, that's a right? really good there's, one. Yeah. There, there's a couple of these very simple, very fundamental questions. And then addressing those is really fun. Like that, that's a fun conversation to be in. And I'm wondering how how do we open these conversations with people so that they can experience that and maybe shift their shift their thinking a bit. Yeah. Mine is and, um, am I am I gonna um am I gonna have enough time? So yeah, that, those questions should be, I, I should start like 
capturing those. I will do the same. Thank you. I'm starting um, a meeting tomorrow, which is uh, a workshop, and with with some uh, very senior level people. For example, the CEO of uh, Land o Lakes is going to be there. You know, the chair, the board of the chair for the Bionutrient Food Association. So the um, the the owner of uh, a company that works that is a subsidiary of Siemens. So the the uh, the intent is to bring people together from different parts of the supply chain. So there's a couple of farmers in there who we have worked with for some time, sort of uh, like Paul is sort of a philosopher farmer, has a very diversified uh, program. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea is to bring, to get a discussion uh, going where people on their own realize that they are working from within a silo. Um, and that there's all kinds of stuff going on around them that may be of benefit. Um, simply coming you know, out of the introduction, so we're going to start you know, a brief, uh, I asked everybody, take three to five minutes, to just uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you want to accomplish in 2024. <laughs> um, and then uh, let's have a very brief uh, clarifying question, then move on to the next. And they are so diverse. I mean, they are, you know, you have one guy who is a seed core and we had him on a webinar before and he does very specialized seeds that are uniquely suited for like wet climate or dry climate and that sort of thing. Um, so he's completely intrigued because the business opportunity for him you know, with customized seeds are incredible, but how do you get into the market? You know, how do you, how do you get traction and so on? So, I'm I'm just like, um, gosh, I have to like really just sit down and chill out and meditate <laughs> to get uh, to get uh, ready for this. But it is it is uh, if we can pull it off, um, it's an amazing opportunity, you know, to get some some uh, I mean, like Lando Lakes, for example, yeah. uh, also owns Trotera. This guy is also the CEO over Trotera. And they have hundreds of farmers, I mean, several million acres of, of land, uh, which uh, are in their network to supply dairy and to supply feed for dairy. Yeah. Um, so they, they are, so there's a, there's a lot of reach uh, 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 in this. And the, the, there's one guy who uh, has signed up 2 million acres of farmland with multiple farmers to establish a low uh, carbon intensity score for their crops you now so many ideas that are thriving but then you know if you have these low intensity crops what do you do with them how do you sell them into a market that is willing to pay a differentiated price for it yeah um yeah so that uh um that will be that will be an exciting, that will be my next chapter of my neo book, you know. <laughs> How do you avoid to, uh, you're, you're muted, Stuart. No, I'm not. Uh, maybe my brain was muting me. But what I, what I wanted to say with a, a certain level of excitement, it's very interesting. While, while we were sitting here, I just plugged into chat GPT and I have been a um, resistant person. I said to ChatGPT, how do we create a more peaceful world? And it fed back a dozen of the things that that I had written about. So all of a sudden it's, um, okay, how do we use this tool? And, and it was really interesting, um, you know, to, to notice uh, as opposed to being, you know, resistant from an ego level, how do we actually use this tool in a more amazing way? Because the idea that it could spit back, you know, a dozen of the critical high points in an instant, it's like, wow, this is this is amazing. How do we how do how could how do we use this technology? That's that's all I wanted to say with a level of of excitement. And I think it's going to be fun um exploring. Mm -hmm. 
what I'm hearing often is instead of dismissing the, you know, uh, generative AI, the first thing one should do is try it out enough. When you have, <laughs> one has an experience like you just had, Stuart. Uh, it's really interesting. Go ahead, Jesse. Sorry. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm glad you tried it out because I think there is a camp of people who are very, um, you know, don't want to have tech in their lives. And, and then there's a camp that want to lean into it. And I experienced that actually last week so much that um, my, I, I will not go into it, but it was very emotional for a person who didn't want to receive um, a technical um, invite, invitation to um, the, the world of tech. And it actually, there. I, I, I have to say she was, um she was looking at the world as it was threat threatening when technology came to her and the more and more i get to understand that and go deeper i'm noticing that um they they think that technology is going to bring them into a different world that um they they don't want to be a part of they don't want to feel that way but I've noticed that if you just speak to not about peace or like, that's actually what I, what I would love to do is to, how do we have a more peaceful world? It's really to help people sit down and really feel and listen into their bodies versus acting, reacting, they're responding, being responsible. So it starts with the plate of food. And, um, and I, and I just, I just wished that before we even got into this context of like back and forth talk about technology, I wish we would have just talked about food because you can't argue with that where you're like, you want to be feeling the food that you're eating and um, listening to your body as you're eating that you can't argue against that. So meeting people where you can't argue about a topic and then opening them up a little bit more going to the next level is a beautiful thing. And I wish I would have gotten there, but um, that I just want to say that I'm, I'm there right there with you. I want to help make the world more, uh, more peaceful. And I, and I really do think it starts with feeling and listening to the body rather than thinking and doing so much. A absolutely, Jesse, but you, you um, surfaced one of the, um, critical challenges, and that is to move people off of the the frame of you know right, wrong, yes. win, lose, fault, blame. Because as soon as you start using that analytical, you're in a whole different conversation. Then uh, can we talk about this? Because in, in so many phenomenons, um, it's not about right or wrong. Um, it's about exploring. It's about learning. It's about curiosity. Um, it, it's about all of those things. And, and so you ran right up against the thing that I think uh, prevents progress in so many different arenas. And um, it's also something that the, you know, that our, our media perpetuates uh, and our politics perpetuates. For sure. For sure. It, it just made me understand that um, people are very threatened. It's heightened right now. I mean, I, I, don't, I couldn't speak from a thousand years ago, but I feel like people are more threatened these days than 20 years ago. I just feel it. It's yeah. partly maybe that we're, <clears throat> we're so submerged in information that we see everything so quickly, that the news cycle has sped up so much that it feels like we're under more pressure. There's a lot more going on, et cetera. I think there's always been a lot going on. The world has always been pretty complicated, but our experience of it now is much more overwhelming and immediate. And our ability to sort of clear the decks, it takes it takes a concerted effort and a lot of energy to step out of the stream of news media or the social media or your friends' emails or whatever else. Uh, you really have to work to sort of isolate yourself from it. Uh, and that's really hard. But it also brings to mind spiral dynamics again to engage people to where they are at. You know, so Jesse, for example, this group you now is a group of techies, very, you know, but, uh, uh, I mean, very advanced group. So it's a different. It's a uh, so it's okay to talk about technology and 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 uh, and take the the this approach. But in other ways, you may have to reach the heart first before you can get to anything else 
um, and and the the opening it's interesting from all the, the I've written like I don't know 15 newsletters or something like this all in all and the one that resonated the most is the one on biodiversity that really uh Ethan Neal you know from Belgium uh, uh, joined in on that conversation I mean it really hit a chord uh that the, the idea of home you know the, uh, the the land around me the land that I'm connected with um so there is the, there is a very strong need for people to feel and to emote you know, around uh, this whole concept of uh, 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 what are we doing with nature you know what's going on around us particularly for people who live in cities and uh, don't have uh, uh, any kind of connection with the natural world um so that's an important introduction I mean also for the app right I mean you have to uh, you have to have like an opening statement that that resonates first of all on the heart level you know emotion level before uh, you get into you know here's the reason why we built the app to do what it does you know? um, the the the, uh, the the emotional link is you now mm -hmm. we want to you know? it would be really interesting yeah. to see for your app if one of the opening things you did was ask people, do you have a, a picture of your family eating together oh. <clears throat> that you like, that you like either from, you know, a Thanksgiving meal or just a really nice dinner. Uh, if you don't, why don't you take one next, next time you have a get together, take one, but make that your wallpaper in the app or make that, make that some persistent artifact that reminds you often that the social nature of food and the emotional nature of food is so important. But it also asking people to reflect back on that, or even just asking them as an exercise to think back on uh, their favorite last social meal, uh, is is good because it, it sets them, it primes them into that space. Mm, very say good. that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to say that slightly differently, the context that um, you create uh, that people can then um, hang the details of information on is just so important for the way the brain takes in um, information. Yep. Love it. David, where are you with, with your project? You, you haven't been, haven't heard from you in a few weeks. Yeah, we've mostly been traveling. Uh, we just got, we got moved into Berkeley. So we're, we're now back in the Bay. Uh, and uh, hopefully things will get a little bit better organized from now on out. Uh, and yeah, with the with the landscape stack notion, I, I am going to try to continue to socialize. I guess is the next step, really. So I'm going to try to find a couple of organizations that are in the space and just get a better feel of whether it's uh, you know how it fits with the concepts that they're already working with. I guess uh, and. Uh, yeah, and and then I think I, I, was, I want to go back a little bit. I don't know, Jerry. We traded email a week, a couple of weeks ago, around this, uh, around uh, I mean, a Schmidt project or something around funding for, you know, what what do we know about open source? I guess, and I still feel like that's really rich, and I'd love to to mm. dive back into that and how mm -hmm. it works. Kind of, I just feel like I just I I pay a little bit of attention and don't feel like I've seen enough stuff about how. Um, the dynamics that make it successful, basically. Uh, we know we know what we know it can work in a few instances. So I was going to try to these kind of these things overlap a little bit, I think. But if, if the notion is the system has to get dynamically better, what is the driver behind that dynamism? You know, which I think is kind of a business model would be a metaphor, but uh, right. somehow there's an ecosystem that improves this thing. So how do we create that ecosystem? I like that. I'd love to, I'd love to sort of provoke that some more it fits very nicely into neo books and you're kind of this is a tangent but i'm seeing recently there's been backlash against a bunch of things that were exciting a decade ago or five years ago like agile there's pretty strong backlash against agile and you can each of us could probably name three or four things that suddenly have been somehow either poisoned or debunked or just attacked uh, and are slowed down and Open source went through a couple attacks early on, like, you know, Bill Gates was going to try to get rid of it. So it was uh, 
Steve uh, Ballmer and, and so forth, and they failed. They, then they ended up having to use a lot of open source and that's okay. But I, I would love to see a, a refreshed, updated and realistic sort of pro like usefully critical view of open source. Like like here here when you crack the dynamics of this project is what what broke and what worked and what 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 is sort of needed. Here are some lessons we can distill from a couple of decades now of open source of open source work. I think that would be really terrific. And then collecting up some of the the you know the leaders of open source projects and saying, hey, uh, do you agree with, with these results or this thesis or what what advice would you add? Would make would make an interesting interview series in connection with it. So maybe maybe starting with starting with a study and finding out who's already done some work and doing it just a lit review uh, and then some, some thinking about what this is, but then backing that up with, because we're connected through two degrees, we can get to everybody uh, in the open source community practically. It's kind of weird, but, but like it's such a rich, dense community. Um, that would be really fun to do. And we could even, you know, put out a call for opinion videos about open source and say, Hey, you know, answer answer any one of these six questions, and we'll sort of drop you into the playlist. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Well, okay, so let me try this one on you, since since we see how meta we can get, how fast. But one of the one of my cool. insights from driving cross country uh, this this last few weeks was that uh, you know having way too much time to think. But I was reading through John Fullerton, one of his emails about the Capital Capital Institute and, re, and reinventing economics, and you know he starts out with his introduction about where you kind of trash the dystopian world, and and you know there's always this implicit. It, there's all there's always that well not sometimes it's really explicit that like these evil people set us gave us this bad world and now we have to fix it you know and i'm kind of like man i just can't believe they were all that evil you know what but but anyway so somehow we've got capitalism and capitalism is really horrible and i'm never quite clear what part of capitalism people don't like you know i don't know what they mean by it and stuff like that so i you know but but I, but the open source thing so what i was trying to do is like capitalism i guess means management of capital which is, I think you could translate capital to be assets. So we have assets that we want to grow and improve. And if we grow and improve them well, people are better off, right? So we have businesses managing capital and hopefully they manage capital in ways that make things better. You know, So United Airlines manages a bunch of shit and they get me places better than they used to. Then well, I actually think they do, you know? So, so open source is a strategy for managing capital, right? that takes it out of private hands and puts it into something else. And one of the things is, I don't think we've well defined what that something else is. Um, you know, if it's the Linux Foundation, what the fuck is that? Um, right? It's not government, though. It's not private hands and it's not government. Well, it's the commons. Kind of. Is the Linux Foundation the commons? I don't know. I mean, I, no, I don't no, no. think we... The Linux Foundation is a large business uh, designed to bring together a whole bunch of, uh, of open source projects built around Linux. And then create mechanisms to promote them, uh, make sure that they're like like that they're healthy ecosystems. There's a whole whole bunch of sort of subdivisions to it, <clears throat> but they're trying they're they're kind of the, the 800 pound gorilla in that space, right? But in and some then if sense, you're... they're managing the ecosystem, or they're they have a license that we call the commons, right? I mean, they kind of own the asset, um, um, kind but, the, but the license has made it harder to own right so it's changed the, you know like i can they can somebody can still fork it right which makes the ownership less anyway i don't know right there, there's but but so if we had a much more open source world the intent would be much more of the assets would be what in the commons or wherever it is these things are which yeah. is a transition in capitalism right it's a, it's where we've got you know and if we and if that's big, I mean, does that I mean, do we how big does that have to be before it matters? I guess is kind of the question. How much of the world has to be open sourced before you've effectively de defanged capitalism? Uh, Love that. And, and I think a whole bunch of this is about ownership and rights, uh, because normal capitalism uh, basically says it's mine, not yours, and I will sell it to you so that you can use it. Where open source is like. Hey, it's a common asset. We might both make a living off it, but we share the asset. So there's there's very different lines drawn and assumptions made around ownership and access, because one of the big things in open source is everybody can see it, which then creates these knock-on effects about um, how functional is it, how many bugs does it have, 
Uh, how many new features does it get because people just riffed on it and then suggested a, a pull, you know, things like that. It's it's really like like the, the ongoing dynamics are, are fascinating. And it, it, I think it, it, it makes it at least you, you have to you have to have a different set of talents to make open source extractive. Right. I mean, you know, so you, it changes the extractive modalities, I think. Um, right. And, and, and there's an know. argument there's an argument that Pete will make now and then that Microsoft is trying to buy up open source. Because they bought GitHub, there's a whole bunch of sort of movable, movable pieces here that Microsoft is playing with strategically, um, and it's unclear that they're they just have this benevolence about all those assets. It's uh, you know Microsoft's historic strategy is engulf and devour, and uh, there's there's not that many reasons to believe that they've suddenly turned into the stu the best stewards possible of the commons. No, and well, and the excuse, the explanation we heard from one of the Microsoft guys was that um, their biggest, their biggest revenue generator is the cloud, and they're um, and they want as much, they want to, they want to sell as many cycles as they can in open source as an easy way to sell cycles, which right. is like, well, it makes some sense, you know, but you know, there must, there could be other things. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I you'd never, you would, you would never trust any of these people very, as if, if humanity will be extracted if given the opportunity, I think. So you keep having to like, you know, put it back to the box. That's the spiral dynamics, I suppose, Klaus. It's like, it never stops. Yeah, what, what's coming up for me listening to this is um, the whole notion of um, capitalism's okay, but then you get into um, how people go over the edge with it or go over the top or, or when anything, it, a phenomenon starts to bend back on itself because um, um, what started off as good becomes not so good. I, I'm, 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 I'm grappling for words here, but the analogy that came up was at some moment in time, um, you know, you've got the, all the antitrust legislation in the US as an example that organizations can't get too big. <laughs> now, I'm not an expert in that area, but now you can't have monopolies that are in restraint of trade. Those principles um, uh, that create some limitations, I think, uh, apply to capitalism in, in general. And what popped up in my mind is, so what would happen if the government, for example, said, um, no individual can accumulate more than uh, $300 million or some number, all right? Um, what impact might that have um, in terms of people uh, operating on an absolute value of, you know, accumulation is good or greed is good, and let's keep going on that. Um, and all of a sudden you have some government regulation that says, uh, well, it's good to a point, and then it's not so good. I'm, hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. Okay, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. there, there, uh, is this, there is this book series of the uh, of the Middle Ages, the British how, how the British churches uh, got founded and the first building of cathedrals. Remember that part in this book series is talking about how the church. Uh, controlled markets. So in other words, you know, there was in the middle of the village, there was a marketplace. Uh, it was inside the wall and the church had uh, uh, soldiers out there that protected the integrity of the market. You know, you couldn't go in there, steal. Uh, you, you, you couldn't uh, harm each other. So the, the church, the, a, a big function of the church at that time, you know, in, uh, when were the first domes built, like in the uh, 800, 900, so I mean, in the Middle Ages, they were right? in the Dark Ages, actually. And and so, uh, but the church uh, made uh, created a a reason for being there that went that really maintained uh, a functioning market economy. Uh, so, so any farmer you know, could uh, bring their wares to the market, the tool maker could bring their wares to the market. And what has happened, and, and throughout history, the the fight, the food fights were always over access to markets. You know, who controls the markets? 
who takes a, a byte you know, for every transaction and so on and so on. And the beauty <clears throat> of an open market economy is that it incentivizes you know, people to uh, you know, to do better and more and and uh, and engage and um, the the what what has happened and the antitrust laws you know, were primarily designed to prevent uh, oligopolies and and mono, mono, uh, mono, monopolistic practices from wiping out uh, markets and preventing access for new entries because that stops the creativity of the market as well. Yeah, so right now. What we need to have is a decentralization in the market so you can have innovators and innovations gain access to the market and and uh, and scale. And the markets are just are just uh, clogged up, you know? <laughs> but what happens if um, everybody has enough? <laughs> everybody has enough. So what function are, are, are markets serving? I'm just, you know, speculating here and throwing that out as, a, as an idea. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the normal dichotomous, the normal false dichotomy presented is that any kind of centralized planning will allocate resources so that everybody has enough very poorly and that markets are the absolute best way to do that, which yeah. I think is, as I said, a, a false dichotomy. Uh -huh. um, and I think there's plenty of other interesting ways of distributing, of creating and distributing what people need. Uh, but we don't, we, we lack imagination now and we lack good examples of that actually functioning in other places. For those of you who don't know, the OGM call last Thursday was about governance. And uh, we're gonna, this coming Thursday, we're gonna do a regular check-in call, but then next week we're gonna go back to governance, which bleeds right into capitalism. So Dave, if you're interested, like the, the you know, two, two Thursdays from now at 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, if you if you'll join us, I'm going to try to recruit more souls into the call. Uh, we also all made a pledge, which I'm just remembering now, to bring somebody who who is not in our demographic to the call, so that it's not all white guys, which happens a lot on our calls. Um, but uh, we'd like to dive you know way deeper into these questions. But 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 Stuart, you're pointing at some of the fundamental things people are, criticize capitalism and socialism slash communism for, and there's a misunderstanding of all the terms. Uh, you know, we don't all agree on what democracy is, on what capitalism is. All those things are are squishy and fuzzy, in 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 a, what what is to me a fascinating way. I mean, these these systems have so eaten our lives, and we live we are so immersed in them that our lack of solid definitions for them and an understanding of what is in and outside the system, I don't really fully understand. Like like, are consumers capitalists? So if capitalism is about owning capital, then it's the owners of capitalism who are the real capitalists. Consumers are just the, the pawns that are making capitalism work. They're, they're the raw materials that are buying up the products, but are they really capitalists? Maybe well, when that... they own, own shares of stock, which is the way you own the means of production in a capitalist society, but that's really, nobody, nobody outside the company of any tiny scale has any say in how the company runs, period. You might get to benefit in the shares of appreciation of that stock. Is it? That's it. Period. Right. So it's it's really messy and complicated. Yeah. Well, one of the questions I would I've been wondering about with the uh, open source. So we got to go back and visit Indonesia this uh, uh, last year, and I had we hadn't been there since the mid '90s, right? So it's been about 25 years. Three years? I don't know. Long time. And. Uh, it, it's quite different, right? The country just changed dramatically in 30 years. <clears throat> and it's it's just a very kind of self-confident kind of inherent, you know, kind of you know, at least the at least the big islands are. And and I felt the same way in Thailand and Vietnam and uh certainly Singapore and you know your your uh, big chunks of India. And it's it's the transformation that we've gone through in our lifetime, I think it's really remarkable. And this has been a transformation driven by, I think, a lot of the, you know, the Washington consensus, I think, worked, basically, you know, I don't, I don't know, I can't, in many ways, the, you know, the, the I, you know, I can't get away from the idea that, you know, poverty levels globally have dropped dramatically, and you can see it, you know, it's, it's, it's real, um, that doesn't mean there's no more poor people out there, but, but it's quite different than it was uh, when we were kids, and, I wondered a little bit. I, I, somebody must have done some numbers, but like, how much did that did open source matter in all of that? Right? How much development is going on in India or Vietnam or or Jakarta 
because the source code's available, right? All the stuff can be changed in all kinds of formats. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's got a got an Uber delivery competitor. Are they all running off of the same code base? How many years did we save people essentially, you know, in problem solving by opening up all these intellectual assets uh, globally, right? Uh, yeah, people yeah. who didn't who never contributed back to them at the beginning, or maybe still don't. I don't know. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's again. I don't know if it's a big number or a small number, but I bet it, I bet it mattered some. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how much. So, so David, to that I say, was that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> Which is another, you know, that's a that's a question. Yeah, they caught up in some ways, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because a, a lot of the conversation now is looking back on more indigenous practices, and so. Did they, you know, leap ahead? Uh, only I, I didn't get a lot of the conversation among white people I know is looking back on indigenous practices. <laughs> <laughs> Did not hear a lot of that conversation amongst the Indonesians I was talking to. They weren't that okay. concerned. Yeah, all right. Um, now yeah. it's true that there's like I mean, I and we didn't spend any time in the jungles in Kalimantan or anything, right? I mean, we were we were uh, so so. There's all kinds of different contexts, but. I, I mean, I personally feel like there is a little bit of romanticism of some of the, you know, of indigenous life, and I'm I'm still skeptical a little bit of some of the, the utopian perspectives on, you know, how how well the Bushmen lived in the old days and stuff. But um, so I mean, at some point, whether you, if if we have to decide whether the change is good or bad, as an external actor, I don't know where we go. I don't I don't know. Somehow the people inside the action probably have to be able to decide that. I, I don't know how to get there, but. But from a from a point of view, hungry people on the street, that I think is an unqualified improvement. Yeah, I, I I agree. Which it just raises the the complexity of all of the things that that we're talking about. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm glad we opened up all these Pandora's boxes on this call. Yeah. Yep. I always um, leave with more questions than answers, Jerry. It's a complaint yeah. of mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> good, good, good question. Really good. I leave, I leave with a whole bunch of open tabs. I then got to go figure out what to do with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dave, um, I have a really mixed feeling about this indigenous uh, uh, conversation, uh, maybe because of my European background. Um, I, we we talk about and and because I've been traveling with the Sierra Club and you know, a group of NGOs, uh, Forum for the Future and so on, and they are very very focused on assisting uh, you know, minorities that uh, uh, that have been so disenfranchised and in particular the indigenous groups. I mean, it's just incredibly shameful. Not just here in Canada and Australia, you know, um, Africa. My God, I mean, it's, I've been some really. I mean, it makes you really think uh, what kind of a horrible creed we are, you know, the Europeans really, that uh, perpetuated, that uh, brought it, all this misery onto the world. I mean, this whole thing in the Middle East is basically, you know, remnants of white uh, European domination. But conversely, the Japanese are indigenous people. They have lived on the same land for you know, thousands of years and they haven't screwed up their soil. Now, they haven't screwed up their water. They keep feeding themselves, the Germans, the French, the Italians, right? I mean, the Greeks, the Spaniards. I mean, all of these cultures have lived you know, for hundreds of years, and in some cases for thousands of years, on the same soil, right? And they were able to keep going. And we have managed to kill 40% of our topsoil since World War II. Don't you think there is like there is something that is captured in the notion of a, col a colonialist mindset, I think, in that this notion that I can go to South Carolina and start farming and five years burn my farm out and then just go in a, another couple of miles and do it again. Right. And that is somehow captured in the notion of colonialism, I think. And so I don't know. I, I do think I mean, I'm not saying there's no insights in in the understanding of indigenous peoples. And I've learned a ton more than I ever thought I would. Uh, but I'm just saying that there's also, I think there's a uh, glorification that's probably unwarranted, you know, that, that's like, yeah. it wasn't utopia either, you know, with this kind of, but there's a lot we can learn. There there are little pieces of the answer every place. And and Klaus, I think what you're uh, pointing to, the, the distinction between the U.S. practices and the European practices is for some reason, 
the, the mindset in the U.S. was, oh, land is unlimited, where, you know, Europe has got a great history of, of wars and wars and wars over, over land. So, and, and people had more of a, 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 a sense of how valuable um, it was and that it wasn't an un, unlimited supply. Mm -hmm. Well, they also started, uh, had some periods of hunger because they did screw up. They, they saw it, you know, like a thousand years ago, all there of a sudden go. the land dried <laughs> up, right? Like, oh, what happened? You know? <laughs> and uh, so they learned the hard way for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, I love these questions. They're, my brain is a little full. Um, so thank you for, for bringing them up. Uh, shall we wrap our call for this this week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Great talk. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Thank, Thank you listening. very much. Thank you. Appreciate everyone. it. Thank bye bye. You.